Key point, the advent of cheap, stealthy, and long-enduring diesel submarines is yet another factor placing carriers and other expensive surface warships at greater risk when operating close to defended coastlines. Fortunately, this did not occur in actual combat but was simulated as part of a wargame pitting a carrier task force including numerous anti-submarine escorts against HSMS Scotland, a small Swedish diesel-powered submarine displacing 1,600 tons. Yet despite making multiple attack runs on the Reagan, the Gotland was never detected. In 2005, USS Ronald Reagan, a newly constructed $6.2 billion dollar aircraft carrier, sank after being hit by multiple torpedoes, fortunately. This did not occur in actual combat but was simulated as part of a wargame pitting a carrier task force including numerous anti-submarine escorts against HSMS Scotland, a small Swedish diesel-powered submarine displacing 1,600 tons. Yet despite making multiple attack runs on the Reagan, the Gotland was never detected, this outcome was replicated time and time again over two years of war games, with opposing destroyers and nuclear attack submarines succumbing to the stealthy Swedish sub. Naval analyst Norman Polmar said the Gotland ran rings around the American Carrier Task Force. Another source claimed U.S. anti-submarine specialists were demoralized by the experience. How was the Gotland able to evade the Reagan's elaborate anti-submarine defenses involving multiple ships and aircraft employing a multitude of sensors? And even more importantly, how was a relatively cheap submarine costing around $100 million, roughly the cost of a single F-35 stealth fighter today, able to accomplish that? After all, the U.S. Navy decommissioned its last diesel submarine in 1990. Diesel submarines in the past were limited by the need to operate noisy, air-consuming engines that meant they could remain underwater for only a few days before needing to surface. Naturally, a submarine is most vulnerable and can be most easily tracked, when surfaced, even when using a snorkel. Submarines powered by nuclear reactors, on the other hand, do not require large air supplies to operate, and can run much more quietly for months at a time underwater and they can swim faster while at it. However, the 200-foot-long Swedish Gotland-class submarines, introduced in 1996, were the first to employ an air-independent propulsion AIP, system, in this case, the Stirling engine. A Stirling engine charges the submarine's 75 kilowatt battery using liquid oxygen. With the Stirling, a Gotland class USS submarine can Patrol. remain undersea for up to two weeks, sustaining an average speed of 6 miles per hour, or it can expend its battery power to surge up to 23 miles per hour. A conventional diesel engine is used for operation the on the Commander, surface while activities employing the snorkel. The Stirling powered Gotland runs more quietly than even a nuclear powered sub which must employ noise-producing coolant pumps in their reactors, the Gotland class does possess many other features that make it adept at evading detection. It mounts 27 electromagnets designed to counteract its magnetic signature to magnetic anomaly detectors. Its hull benefits from sonar-resistant coatings, while the tower is made of radar-absorbent materials. Machinery on the interior is coated with rubber acoustic deadening buffers to minimize detectability by sonar. The Gotland is also exceedingly maneuverable thanks to the combined six maneuvering surfaces on its X-shaped rudder and sail, allowing it to operate close to the seafloor and pull off tight turns. Because the stealthy boat proved the ultimate challenge to U.S. anti-submarine ships in international exercises, the U.S. Navy leased the Gotland and its crew for two entire years to conduct anti-submarine exercises. The results convinced the U.S. Navy its undersea sensors simply were not up to dealing with the stealthy AIP boats, however, the Gotland was merely the first of many AIP-powered submarine designs some with twice the underwater endurance. And Sweden is by no means the only country to be fielding them, China has two diesel submarine types using Stirling engines. Fifteen of the earlier type 039A Yuan class have been built in four different variants, with more than 20 more planned or already under construction. Beijing also has a single type 032 Qing class vessel that can remain underwater for 30 days. It is believed to be the largest operational diesel submarine in the world and boasts seven vertical launch system cells capable of firing off cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. Russia debuted with the experimental Lada class St. Petersburg, which uses hydrogen fuel cells for power. It is an evolution of its widely produced Kilo class submarine. However, sea trials found that the cells provided only half of the expected output, and the type was not approved for production. 
However, in 2013 the Russian Navy announced it would produce two heavily redesigned Ladas, the Kronstadt and Velikai Luki. Expected by the end of the decade, other producers of AIP diesel submarines include Spain, France, Japan, and Germany. These countries have in turn sold them to navies across the world, including to India, Israel, Pakistan, and South Korea. Submarines using AIP systems have evolved into larger, more heavily armed, and more expensive types, including the German Dolphin class and the French Scorpion class submarines. The US Navy has no intention to field diesel submarines again, however, preferring to stick to nuclear submarines that cost multiple billions of dollars. It's tempting to see that as the Pentagon choosing once again a more expensive weapon system over a vastly more cost-efficient alternative. It's not quite that simple, however, diesel submarines are ideal for patrolling close to friendly shores. But US subs off Asia and Europe need to travel thousands of miles just to get there and then remain deployed for months at a time. A diesel submarine may be able to traverse that distance, but it would then require frequent refueling at sea to complete a long deployment, remember the Gotland? It was shipped back to Sweden on a mobile dry dock USS rather than patrol. making the journey on its own power. This is a great Though the new AIP-equipped diesel subs may be able to go weeks without surfacing, that's still not as good as going months without having to do so. And furthermore, a diesel Commander, submarine with or without AIP Zuposka. can't sustain high underwater speeds for very long, unlike a nuclear submarine. A diesel sub will be most effective when ambushing a hostile fleet whose position has already been queued by friendly intelligence assets. However, the slow, sustainable underwater speed of AIP-powered diesel submarines make them less than ideal for stalking prey over vast expanses of water. These limitations don't pose a problem to diesel subs operating relatively close to friendly bases, defending littoral waters. But while diesel submarines may be great while operating close to home, the US Navy usually doesn't. Still, the fact that one could build or acquire three or four diesel submarines costing $500 to $800 million each for the price of a single nuclear submarine gives them undeniable appeal. Proponents argue that the United States could forward deploy diesel subs to bases in allied nations without facing the political constraints posed by nuclear submarines. Furthermore, advanced diesel submarines might serve as a good counter to an adversary's stealthy subfleet, however, the US Navy is more interested in pursuing the development of unmanned drone submarines. Meanwhile, China is working on long-enduring AIP systems using lithium-ion batteries, and France is developing a new large AIP-equipped diesel submarine version of its Barracuda-class nuclear attack submarine. The advent of cheap, stealthy, and long-enduring diesel submarines is yet another factor placing carriers and other expensive surface warships at greater risk when operating close to defended coastlines. Diesel submarines benefiting from AIP will serve as a deadly and cost-effective means of defending littoral waters, though whether they will carve out a role for themselves in blue-water naval forces operating far from home is less clear.